Good evening, Carter County Geological Society, and welcome to the March 4th, 2021 meeting. Tonight's presentation is on Camp Needmore, a history. Research by Lois Lambert and presentation by Sabre Moore. On April 16, 1935, a small delegation came from Billings to inform Forest Ranger Butler and Relief Administrator Oscar Dahl that a Civilian Conservation Corps camp would be built five miles south of Ekalaka, near the Needmore Ranger Station, sometime next month. 200 enrollees and supervisors would occupy the camp, working at fencing, forest thinning, building forest trails, spring development, and other work to improve the value of the Ekalaka Division of the Custer National Forest. That camp is still in use. It was once the only camp in southeastern Montana that can accommodate 150 campers. You may be wondering, what was the Civilian Conservation Corps? In the middle of the Depression, Franklin D. Roosevelt took office, March 4, 1933. In his first 100 days of office, Roosevelt created a number of emergency agencies. One of these was the Civilian Conservation Corps, or CCC, which provided employment for as many as 500,000 youths working in forests, parks, and rangeland. The initial call was for 250,000 unmarried boys between the ages of 18 and 25. 14,000 American Indians were enrolled to deal with unemployment and soil erosion on reservations, and 24,000 experienced men were added to supervise the crews. Soon, World War I veterans in their 30s and 40s were also authorized for enrollment. Enlistment was for six months with re-enlistment and six month tours for up to two years. The enrollee earned $30 each month with $25 sent back to his family. Room, board, and clothing were provided for a 40 hour work week. Each camp had a medical reserve officer or a contract physician and an infirmary. Dentists came every six months. Enrollees had to pass a physical exam and were inoculated against typhoid fever and smallpox. The young men were required to bathe weekly, brush teeth daily, keep fingernails bedding and clothing clean. The average day began at 6 a.m. with trucks loaded at 7.15. 30 minutes were allowed for lunch with trucks back at camp by 4 p.m. Inspection was at five, followed by supper. Lights were out at 10 p.m. Beer was all right in camp, but hard liquor forbidden. Young men had weekends free and were granted two trips home in six months. On average, boys gained over 11 pounds in their first three or four months at camp. CCC projects in Western Montana were involved in forestry where Glacier National Park saw much work. Combating soil erosion received more emphasis in Eastern Montana. And in South Dakota, projects included fire prevention, reforestation, and developing recreational facilities. More than 25,600 men from Montana enlisted in the CCC. Over 48,800 worked in the state's 24 camps. In the summer of 1935, a federal program funded the construction of a CCC camp south of Ekalaka that housed nearly 200 young men working at fencing and other projects outside, just outside of Ekalaka. By early June, 10 buildings had been completed, including four barracks, 130 feet long by 20 feet wide, with the capacity to house 52 people, a recreation hall with the administration offices and camp store, a bathhouse and drying room with running water, a 42-foot hospital, and 130-foot building housing CCC officers and forestry quarters. The forestry department was going to build garages for the trucks. In the June 14, 1935 Eagle, Oscar Dahl reported the arrival of new recruits to the Windy Valley CCC camp. They arrived in huge enclosed government trucks. There were now 152 boys at the camp, and then the camp was quarantined for measles and mumps. There were three cases of measles and eight cases of mumps. Because so many of the recruits were from Eastern Montana, they were able to go home for Christmas, leaving only a few over the minimum of 50 men in the camp over the holiday. After Christmas, there was another outbreak of mumps, this time affecting 12 recruits, and many young men were down with scarlet fever. Spring plans called for the enrollees to be evacuated by May 1st, but the governor and a state legislator interceded for Ekalaka, asking that the camp be continued for at least another six months. The decision rested with CCC officials in Washington, who had the CCC group packing by May 15th, but not before May 8th public gathering. Everyone was invited for a free lunch, evening entertainment, and dance. More than 400 guests from Ekalaka and the surrounding area attended. Hundreds of men spent time at the CCC camp south of Ekalaka. These are only a few of their stories, the results of interviews and letters exchanged. 
The men also generously donated pictures to be copied, some of which accompany these articles. George Biddle was only 16 years old when he enlisted in the CCC in Circle, Montana on May 21st, 1935. It was his first time away from home. When recruits traveled to Missoula, it was different from anything he'd ever seen before. Kids didn't travel then, didn't get out from behind the barn, said George. George was raised a circle, but in 1935, there weren't any jobs or money. On June 7th, 1935, his unit moved to Ekalaka, where he stayed until October 15th. At first, the unit lived in tents, said George, before barracks were built. George's job as kitchen supplier took him to Ekalaka once a week for a quarter of beef from a local grocer. The trip took half a day because the young men fooled around visiting the local skating rink where they were found the owner's pretty daughter. Flirting with her was lots better than KP duty, according to George. George was very homesick and he left the CCC at the end of his six month enlistment on October 15th, 1935. Ivan Jardy was 19 when he enlisted in the CCC's, a young man from a ranch family just north of Ekalaka. When the call went out for enlistments, Jardy responded. It was the only thing going on to make any money. Ivan served for three years in different CCC camps throughout Montana, advancing to the rank of leader. Among the camp's machinery was a Claire Trek 55 dozer. John Burdick with the Forest Service taught Ivan to run it and he spent much of the winter of 1935 to 36 plowing snow to keep a roadway open to town. It was like shoveling snow with a teaspoon, the man said, trying to move drifts with a small dozer and its nine foot blade. At times, Roadways were abandoned and a path cleared through the open prairie. Work details were assigned in squads, military style. Ivan was on the powder crew, clearing the right of way, dynamiting stumps. George Shiler, another local man, worked there too. The men wore khakis or blue jeans. Although though, there was complaining, Ivan said the men had a good diet. Workers at the camp were from all over and they had their own doctors. Harry Tisella was 18 when he enlisted in the Civilian Conservation Corps in Miles City in 1935. A farm boy from Olive, he traveled to Fort Missoula before his unit was transferred to Ekalaka. A member of Unit 1999, he worked with the Forest Service south of Ekalaka, developing springs and fencing. Harry was an axeman in Sawyer. Some young men were sent to a spike camp in the Long Pines to cut timber for fence posts. After the cutting crew had felled the trees, they were snaked out to the trucks to be picked up. The crew used one horse and Harry was the driver having worked with horses since he was 15, 14. He also got the job as camp barber. During the winter of 1935 to 36, severe cold and snow curtailed work in the timber and barracks took turns supplying firewood. He was with the CCC outside Ekalaka for one year. Almost every Saturday, there was a dance in Ekalaka. CCC boys would spend their time at the roller rink until the dance began. At the Armistice Day dance, Harry met a girl from Baker, Genevieve Seaman. Though recruits weren't supposed to have cars, one fellow had a Chevy parked, quote, over the hill, said Harry. When the men got time off on weekends, Harry went to Baker to see Genevieve. Once, Genevieve's younger sister slammed the door in Harry's face, but that apparently didn't deter him. They married on September 3rd, 1936, and lived in Helena. Harvey Coons of Ekalaka spent six months at the local CCC camp. Assigned here in October, 1935, he arrived just in time for the terrible winter of 1935 to 36. With nearly 200 recruits, the camp was a prime spot for disease, where mumps and scarlet fever warranted quarantine. After Christmas 1935, Harry sat with Bob Weir, another local CCC recruit, during his siege of the scarlet fever. When 11 or 12 men got mumps, they were quarantined to the Baker Hospital, explained Harvey. Another time, 16 or 17 recruits were hospitalized. Weir, Lester, and Gordon Peabody were other local men who served at the camp, later known as Camp Needmore. Harvey worked at rip wrapping, thinning the timber in the Custer National Forest, making treating and stacking posts. After serving locally, Harvey fought fire near Great Falls in Southern Oregon and Northern California, worked as a teamster hauling gravel, and served on a felling crew in Washington, D.C. before leaving the CCC. Art joined Camp 765 at Boys in March of 1940 and moved with the group to Ekalaka in April. Many of his memories are musical as he played with the band in Ekalaka. Mess Sergeant Bing Baker was also on the drums, Art on the clarinet, and a local fellow on the saxophone. He wished he could remember the name of the lady who played the piano. The group played for dances at a hall attached to a saloon in Ekalaka. 
Art took the camp newspaper into Iglaca to the local printer and spent most of the day getting it set and printed. The camp had a baseball team that played on the Iglaca diamond and recruits enjoyed roller skating and dances in town. Art was a, one of the truck and ambulance drivers for the camp until he was promoted to assistant educational advisor. He left the camp in September of 1940 and returned to his home in Angelin, North Dakota. These are some images of the Nodak Rambler newsletter, which he produced. In 1953, he accepted the position of director of bands at Moorhead State University in Moorhead, Minnesota, where he taught for 30 years. Art recalled, quote, wonderful memories of the time in my life during the depression when times were tough, but I was given an opportunity to be part of a national program that was of great benefit to young men and the projects they built are still in use today. When the CCC left in 1936, Charles Hankamp was appointed caretaker. He brought his family to Ikalaka, his wife, their five-year-old son, Charlie, and 12-year-old daughter, Lorraine. For three years, they lived in the upper southeast of buildings at the camp, pumping water from the spring into a tank above. In winter, they hauled water from the spring by hand using buckets. The two children attended the Buck School, which was about one and a half miles from Camp Needmore, located on property now part of the Hamill Ranch. George Kittleman was also a student there and became young Charlie's friend. The teacher was Joyce Fulver. During one blizzard, the teacher, teacher took all the children to her home, which was located between the present day Hamill and Rathy residences. Charles Handcamp later located it, collected his children using the family horse, target, and a stone boat. North of the camp, about 100 to 200 yards outside the gate, was a ranger station consisting of a cabin, a white house, and a fenced horse pasture. The ranger's black horse was named Tony, and Charlie could easily catch him. The family had an REO speed wagon truck and would usually get supplies by calling Eklaka and having them left with the mail on the highway where the family picked them up. In 1937, a WPA work crew built fences and treated posts at Camp Needmore. According to Randy Rathy, the Handcamp family spent 1940 living in Eklaka. When Rathy was very young, his father died, and he was raised by Charlie Handcamp, the five-year-old boy whose father was caretaker at Camp Needmore from 1936 to 1940. On April 19, 1940, CCC ca Camp 765 moved to the Ikalaka area from Boys, where they had been stationed for two years. For the next six months, work progressed, building storage dams and small reservoirs in the Chalk Buttes, Box Elder Grazing District. At May 31st, 1940, at an open house, camp spokesman announced with regret that not enough water was available to construct an outdoor swimming pool. And on October 11th, 1940, the camp was empty again with officials, enrollees, and camp equipment headed back for boys. The campsite was returned to supervision of the Forest Surgery Service. These are a few names of Carter County residents that became members of the CCC. And at the bottom, a few that helped to build the CCC camp, later known as Camp Needmore, out here in Carter County. Camp Needmore was then taken over by American Legion Post number 60 in 1946, a nine and a half acre recreational area owned by the US Forest Service. It served as a wonderful location for the annual 4-H camp attended by young people from Southeastern Montana and Western North Dakota. Over the years, buildings began to deteriorate and the American Legion was unable to finance repairs. At that time, a new lease was made with Carter County. A rebuilding committee was formed with almost unanimous community support. Work started in 1972, necessitated by a state board of health ruling that closed the camp that year. Improvements started in the kitchen area with donated funds and help. Between Carter County contributions and individual pledges, the rebuilding product had nearly $6,000 by, by July 1st, 1973. Extension agent Jean Hoff applied for grants and led the charge of volunteer workers to improve the camp. The original barracks were divided into six smaller cabins and kitchen renovations were accomplished. A 36 foot by 24 foot restroom was built and all utility wiring in the camp was placed underground. In 1975, three sessions of 4-H camps were held serving a total of nearly 400 people. Camp Needmore was the site for church camps, family reunions, and even football camp as the Baker team took advantage of the local facility. In the fall of 1997, a new foundation was poured for the mess hall and the front entry was made handicapped accessible and two other entries had aluminum handrails installed. 
Some repair work was done to the fireplace and siding. In 1999, a new concrete slab was poured and portable pack of basketball hoops were purchased to improve game conditions. Wooden shingles on the mess hall were replaced with a metal roof and new bug beds were made for the cabins to replace cots dating back to CCC days. The constant flow of projects, repairs, and upgrades is necessary to keep the camp in good working order. There are currently six cabins, a mess hall, one shower bathroom, two outhouses, and a well house. There are electrical, ho electrical hookups for campers and a concrete pad for games. The camp is open year round, although water is turned off during the winter. An annual work day is scheduled each spring. Nearly every weekend in warm weather and hunting season, the camp is reserved for 4-H camp, weddings, reunions, church groups, visitors, and of course, hunters. This is an image of what the Camp Need More looks like today with all the cabins labeled. Thank you for joining us for this special presentation about Camp Need More. And be sure to catch our presentation next month on April 1st at 7 p.m. Mountain Standard Time right here on Facebook and YouTube. All the information that I gave tonight will be preserved on a sign that will be installed at Camp Need More this spring. The sign was designed by Jen Hall, again, with information provided by Lois Lambert and funding for the sign provided by a Reimagining Rural Grant from the Montana Community Foundation. Another collection will also be added to the Montana Memory Project later this year. Thank you for joining us and have a great evening.